our first reading, Genesis 21, 8 through 21. Rob? The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of her sheep. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about a distance of a bullshot. And she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bull. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Here is it. My name is Hagar. The story, part of the story that you heard about me today in the, from the Hebrew scriptures is just the second part of the story. And as you already know, praise to Yahweh, I survived a very scary, dangerous time in the wilderness and went on to be part of God's promise. But I want to tell you about, begin by telling you about the first Time I was in the wilderness. I was there as a very young woman and a runaway, a runaway slave. Now, I had running away from my mistress, Sarah, because she was cruel to me. She hadn't always been cruel. I need to go back and tell you about how I came to be in Sarah and Abraham's household. Sometime before, Sarah had come to be, to live in the harem of the king of Egypt, my father. What was a married woman doing in the harem of the king of Egypt, you want to know? Very good question. I will just tell you that she was there because of Abraham's fear. And that's another story. However, when she was there, the Egyptian king learned to respect Sarah's strong uprightness, woman of great integrity. And he also learned respect for her God. So when it finally came time, after not very long, and he sent her back to her husband's house, he sent with her great load of gifts, a treasure trove. Now he wanted to make sure he made solid a liaison with Abraham's household, <coughs> partly because of his respect for them, but then there was also the respect and more for their God, who he knew was very powerful, and that needed to be 
a good, solid relationship that he established. Among that treasure trove of gifts that he gave to Sarah was me. He did it partly because that was a very strong way of saying, I want to be in liaison. I want to be part of your household. But he also knew from his respect for God and God's power, he believed that I would be better off even as a servant in Sarah and Abraham's household than I could ever be as even a princess in an Egyptian court. So I went, and you can see that Sarah knew I was of royal blood. She also found me intelligent and good company, and we always had a, a mutuality in our relationship that was a lot stronger than, than uh, you would expect from a slave and an owner. <clears throat> and she treated me quite well. Well, when Sarah had been 65 and her husband 75, God had called them out of the land where they had, were born, brought them to a wide open space and said, Abraham, look around you. I'm going to give all of this to you. And furthermore, I'm going to give you enough descendants to populate it. Well, at that time, Sarah and Abraham didn't have any children. And another 10 years went by, still no children. Now Sarah's 75, married to a man who's 85. You can not blame her much for deciding to help God along with the promise. So she came to me and she said, hey, God. I want you to be joined together with Abraham and have a child. She didn't command me to do it. It wasn't her style, not with our relationship. She talked me into it. She said, just think how honored you will be to be joined with such a holy man. Well, it's true. I knew very well how holy Abraham was. And then I, what I didn't realize at the time is that Sarah was saying it not just because it was true, but because she wanted me to do her bidding, give her a good reason to do her bidding. But I was flattered, I was happy, I was honored. And so Abraham and I were ceremonially linked and you know, I think it may have been the very first night we spent together. I conceived. Well, I was happy. And I was sure Sarah would be happy. I mean, after all, this good friendship had been raised to the level of, of almost sisters by her giving me to Abraham. But when I told her, that's when I found out that her interest was mostly self-interest. They needed an heir. She had not been able to produce it. I was her slave. And if I produced it, then she had produced it. Well, she was very hoity-toity with me at that point. And I was so stung that I wasn't allowed to share this joy. Why did she think that I would hide my joy just to, just to not point out that she was barren? Well, I couldn't and I wouldn't. And very unwisely, I threw it in her face. I said, you know, maybe you're not the righteous woman you seem to be. Otherwise, <coughs> why would you be barren? Well. Sarah threw her shoes in my face and refused to speak to me after that. And she went to Abraham and said, look how this woman is treating me. And it's your fault. The reason she's acting so uppity 
is that you're treating her like a wife, not like a gift that your wife gave you. And I heard this conversation, and I heard Abraham's response, and he said, she's your slave. Do whatever you want to with her. It's neither here nor there with me. And did Sarah ever do exactly as she pleased? I suffered physical abuse. She always had me do a hard, hard work. And before long, I miscarried the baby. Was that her purpose? Well, maybe so, maybe not. These things are hard to determine a motivation, but it is what happened. And you might think that now that this source of jealousy was gone, she would have been happy. But no. The abuse continued. And I have to say that probably part of the reason for that is no matter what Abraham had said, his visits to my tent at night did not stop. And of course she knew that too. Finally, knowing that I was not going to have protection from either of these people. I ran away. Now, I don't know where I thought I was going to go. Certainly not back to the king, my father's house. Because that relationship, that pact, was still firm after all of those years. And for that matter, in several days' journey, in any direction out in that desert, Everybody knew who Abraham was and respected Abraham and well, feared Abraham, at least feared the power of his God. Anywhere I had gone, people would have ratted me out and sent me back home. But, you know, I don't think I cared. If I, if I had thought about it that way, I wouldn't have cared that I was going to die. I would rather die than go back to that abuse. But then the hunger set in. And then the thirst set in. And then the hydration set dehydration set in. And I was petrified. It was clear I was going to die. And while I sat in the desert one day, I heard a voice. Hagar! Servant of Sarah, what are you doing out here? Where do you think you're going? Uh-oh, well, I had lived in Sarah and Abraham's house long enough to know that hearing an angel speak to a person was not all that unusual. And first I thought, well, at least the angel speaks to me. And then I thought, on the other hand, the angel looks at me as a slave too. The angel says, Sarah, go back, submit to your mistress, pick up your role as a servant. And by the way, Hagar, I have news for you. You're pregnant. I had no idea, not yet. Well, the angel had spoken to me and I suddenly realized I was part of this wonderful promise Yahweh had given to Abraham, me personally. And I had the courage to go back. And things were a lot better. I don't know exactly why. Maybe Sarah dis discovered too, finally figured out that this really was going to be their chance for an heir. So she treated me better and Abraham had enough sense not to be quite so enthusiastic about this baby that was coming, show his enthusiasm about this baby that was coming and about how much he liked me. And, but mainly, of course, I was different. The angel had go back and pick up your role as a servant. So things were different. And when the baby was born, Because of the promise that was made not only to Abraham and to Sarah, but personally to me, 
because it had been given to me when my life was saved. Abraham named the baby Ishmael, God hears. And Ishmael grew up and things went on. And finally, Ishmael was 12 years old and there was still no other baby, no baby from Sarah. And then wonder of wonders, suddenly, some other angels visited, and a year later, Sarah bore a baby, and they called him Isaac, laughter, and we did a lot of that. Whenever any important thing happened in Isaac's life, we rejoiced about it. We rejoiced and we were unbelieving at the same time that finally there was this baby after all that time. And when the baby was a year old, there was a momentous celebration of his being weaned. And partly that was a big celebration because this baby, in those times if a baby survived one whole year, there was, he had a much better chance of actually growing up than when he was first born. So, we had the big celebration and there was a lot of laughter as usual and the sad thing is that some reason, Sarah's demon kind of came back. All at once, she could see Ishmael as nothing except competition for her son's inheritance. Ishmael couldn't do anything. <coughs> she saw signs of his Egyptian heritage that he sort of tended toward paganism or violence and, God forbid, violence toward Isaac. She went to Abraham again, took the problem to him again and said, you get rid of this woman and her baby. Well, of course, Abraham was heartbroken, but he had gotten smarter over the years too. So he did what, what Sarah told him to do, especially after God spoke to him and said, Abraham, don't be afraid to do what Sarah's telling you to do. First of all, your, her son Isaac is the one that will end up bearing your name. And second of all, Ishmael is going to be okay. I'm going to give him many descendants. Through him, you will have many descendants. So early one morning, I don't know why he chose early morning, I wondered if it was because he didn't want the rest of the household to know that he was doing this awful thing, sending two members <coughs> of the household off to probably die in the wilderness, or um, I, maybe there was some compassion there that he didn't want everybody feeling sad, but you know, that never works. I mean, you need to be forthright about the hard things. In the long run, it's better not to try to keep those kinds of secrets. Anyway, there was one practical reason, of course. If we left early in the morning, the desert had already warmed up from freezing cold, and there would be a few hours before the sun would be scorching. So, Abraham sent me and Ishmael away with a skin of water and some bread. And off we went into the wilderness. I was numb with grief and with fear. So we wandered around for most of the day and the next day. And when the sun got hot on the next day, the water was already gone. And we sat down to rest under a bush and Ishmael fell asleep in the heat of the day and I took myself away as far as he could have shot an arrow. Far enough that I said, I will not watch him die. And I sat down and I hid.
heaved great sobs of grief, called out to God with great sobs, my grief, so loud that I didn't hear Ishmael when he woke up and started calling to me and asking for water. And then I heard a voice, a voice that I certainly remembered. You know, once an angel has spoken to you, it's a, it, it, it's a musical sound, and yet it goes right down to the bottom of your viscera and vibrates as if it were thunder. And he said, Hagar, what's bothering you? Don't worry about it. I've heard your son Ishmael calling out to me. I tell you again, he is not going to die. He's going to see his children and his grandchildren, and before it's over, over he will, his offspring will have populated a whole na nation. Now, don't be afraid. Go over to him and pick him up and embrace him. It's going to be okay. So of course I did, and as I reached down and put my arms around Ishmael and pulled him up against me, I looked over his shoulder and there was a well. Where did it come from? Well, he lived, we lived. He did have many children. Before long, I had grandchildren tumbling all around our tent. And 12 of them were boys, and they all became chieftains. Let me quiet for just a moment or so. Let the story soak, soak in. Now may God go with us, turn God's face toward us, look on us and remember God's love for us, and give us the grace to live in that love and live for others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.